Today on Monkey Life, Vet Thesar faces a tough challenge when Marmoset Freya suffers a possible life-changing injury. I'm going to try to fix it before amputating. Um, it might work, it might not. Newly arrived Saki monkey Desmond loves his new outdoor enclosure, but will it prove too, too much for his son? He obviously has issues with his mobility. We think he might have issues with his sight as well. And breakfast in the treetops for golden-cheeked gibbons Kim and Tien. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. Hello, Pepsqueak. Hello, Mimi. The park provides a home for more than 250 monkeys and apes from 22 different species. It's been a few weeks since female marmoset Freya was rescued and brought to Monkey World. She was found leaping around on scaffolding outside a block of flats in London. She's settled in well and is delighting in companionship of her own kind. She's made friends with Fred and Sammy and is living with them and enjoying all the benefits of a lovely large outdoor enclosure. But over the last couple of days, the primate care staff have noticed Freya has developed a limp which is affecting her mobility quite badly. She also appears to be in pain. Hello. They've asked local vet Thesar Sastre to come and take a look. She has been lame on her right leg. Um, we did when um, see a small swelling on the heel, um, and potentially a small injury there as well, but um, nothing seemed to be infected or smell bad or anything like that. She's just not using it and it's not seemed to have got any better. Jeremy gets the job of taking Freya out of her box so that they can begin. She's a feisty little marmoset who makes her presence known as she's put under with anaesthetic gas. Thesar can now take a good look at the damaged leg. And it's immediately obvious it's a serious injury. OK, here you are. Mm. Wink. You can see I can dislocate. Wink. Should be, that should be normal. That is abnormal and either it's got a fracture or the ligaments, they've gone. Let's take some x-rays. Okay. Marmosets are tiny primates, and diagnosing and treating a condition with 100% certainty can be difficult. An x-ray of the affected leg will help Thesar see exactly what he's up against. And it's not good news. So the dislocation is happening here. Right? That's why all of this is so swollen, if you compare with that. You mm. see it's very, very nice and smooth, um, well, very little, yeah. right? Um, and this is the hook joint, right? Um, this hook joint, I can actually move it out, right? Yeah, there's bits of bone in there, so there's been a fracture. OK, let's try to help this guy. Treating torn ligaments and fractures on any animal can be problematic. Because marmosets are so tiny, trying to repair Freya's leg with pins and plates would be a very complicated and unusual procedure, with no guarantee of success. The other option could be to amputate. But Thesar has another idea. So what I'm going to try, I'm going to try to fix it before amputating. Um, it might work, it might not. But what I'm going to do is, it's a technique that is called imbrication. And it's basically just getting in there and try to make that ligament that is completely broken, um, try to make an artificial ligament with a strong material that will dissolve eventually in the last six months inside the body. So uh, there's still a possibility that we might end up amputating this limb. But uh, at least we know uh, that's exactly what is happening. And, and, and you know, I'm going to try my best to repair it. Yep, let's do this. Thesar needs to make a large incision so that he can get to both ends of the torn ligament. Yeah, here is the break. 
You see, that's the ligament that is loose. Um, and that's the, that's the ligament, you see, toink, but it's completely loose and, f and uh, in there. Um, so that's where it broke. Using a series of stitches, he ties up the torn ligaments, effectively making a temporary one that will hopefully keep the leg and the joint in the correct position, allowing Freya to heal. It's a fiddly but fairly quick procedure. You remember that this was dislocating, was moving like that. I cannot dislocate it now. So the, the imbrication is done. Um, like I said, might do the job, might not, but certainly this might, might help. Thesar is hopeful but cautious about the outcome. Yeah, we're giving the best chance. I've done it as strong as possible and did a double, double layer in that little area just to hold it as strong as possible. Um, I would restrict the exercise, yes, but it's highly impossible um, in this case. But, you know, it's got a decent chance to save that, layer, that leg, that's for sure. Once Freya has come around from the anaesthetic, she'll be isolated from the others in a smaller bedroom in order to recuperate. The less active she is in the coming days, the more chance her leg will have of healing. The team are keeping everything crossed. Freya will make a full recovery and continue to live a full and happy life with her new family. The two newest arrivals to Monkey World, white-faced Saki monkeys Desmond and Tutu, moved to the park yesterday and are beginning to settle in. Primate carekeeper Karen has had a chance to check the pair over and is happy with 10-year-old Desmond. But his son, 4-year-old Tutu, needs some help. His mobility is limited, so Karen's adding a few extra branches to the outdoor enclosure to help him get around. Yes, yeah, so today's going to be a, a nice morning for them because they're going to be let outside for the first time in their new enclosure. So again, we've just been checking that we think that there's access points everywhere, for particularly two two to get to, um, and we've just done a final check. So we're going to let them out, see what they make of it. Hey there. Hi. Once the slide to the outdoor enclosure is opened, it doesn't take long for Desmond to appear. Good boy. Hi there. He's a bit nervous at first. There are a lot of new sounds, smells and faces to get used to, but once he's satisfied all is well, Desmond is soon moving around the enclosure, investigating his new surroundings. He's even happier when he finds a fruiting apple tree and immediately tucks into the ripe fruit. But his mood changes when he spots a frog on the ground and he starts alarm calling. Thankfully, the little amphibian hops off, leaving a relieved Desmond to continue exploring his new home. He's been all over the enclosure, leaping around, um, Doing really well, really happy, but really nicely keeps going back in and checking where Tutu is. And when you watch them inside, he'll go over to them, they'll nuzzle a little bit on the face and then he'll come back outside. It's kind of like he's encouraging Tutu to come out, but it's really nice that we know that they have a really strong bond and he keeps checking on his son, which is really nice to see. Hi, Tutu. Wanna come see? Eventually, Tutu plucks up the courage to take a look outside. But it's immediately obvious that he's struggling with his new surroundings. He obviously has issues with his mobility. We think he might have issues with his sight as well. So it's just, he has to get used to where everything is and it just takes him longer to do that. And he has to like, kind of process things a lot more because we don't think he can see as well as, as most monkeys and certainly not as well as Desmond. So we, you see him reaching out a lot more to find things rather than just climbing onto them. He doesn't jump um, because of his mobility, so you can see Desmond jumping all over the enclosure, but 
uh, Tutu has to walk everywhere and so we need a lot of more connecting branches and, and platforms and hosing for him. So it just took him a bit longer to figure out how to get out. I think he is happy to be moving around and happy to be in his enclosure and happy to be with his dad. So I think he's content in that sense, but we obviously need to make sure that we are keeping an eye on his health conditions and seeing if we can do anything more for him. Hopefully with help and encouragement from his dad and support from the team, Tutu will settle in and thrive at the park. He'll also have the added benefit of extra company in the park's other resident Saki, female Chloe. I think it'd be really nice when it's a trio. I think, I hope that Chloe will be really happy. She didn't get a massive amount back from Jethro. He wasn't that keen. Um, he was a bit more human focused than Saki focused. So it'd be really nice for her to be with Saki monkeys that are, have normal Saki behavior. So I think she'll be really happy and hopefully the whole trio will be really happy. Over the years, Monkey World has had great success rescuing caring for and breeding golden-cheeked gibbons. They've successfully raised five youngsters, the offspring of Peanut and Pung Yo, and on the other side of the park, Jake and Zoe. Four years ago, two of these youngsters left their parental group to be paired up in their new house and enclosure. Tien, the first golden-cheeked gibbon to be born at the park, joined Kim, who's a year younger and the offspring of Jake and Zoe. They've become inseparable. Kim and Tian as a couple are pretty much the perfect couple. They complement each other. Um, both got very different personalities, but it kind of just seems to, to gel. Uh, and they absolutely adore each other. Um, they're always together. Uh, if someone goes inside, the other one has to go inside and vice versa. So yeah, really nice couple together. Today, the pair are about to be given breakfast. A fresh fruit medley of fisalis, figs and passion fruit. Laura is putting the fruit into specially built feeding stations, which are then pulled up into the tree canopy. The idea is to make sure the fruit is as high up in the trees as possible. To reach it, Kim and Tian will have to hang from the upper branches just like they would in the wild. In their native habitat, gibbons travel far and wide to search for their breakfast. But here, Kim wastes no time heading straight to the nearest feeder. She loves her food and begins to snaffle it up straight away. Showing off his graceful moves, Tian swings effortlessly to the feeder on the other side of the enclosure. He's not as fixated on food as Kim and enjoys being in the trees and eating at a more leisurely pace. Plus, she doesn't like to share. Gibbons are suspensory feeders. They can hang from a branch using one arm while reaching for food with the other. The specialized ball and socket in their shoulders allows them to hang and turn almost a full 360 degrees. It's the technique Kim uses to devour all her food before heading straight over to Tien to see what he's got left in his feed station. She's the more dominant of the two, often leading the way but Tian seems quite content with that. He's a much slower eater and happy to snack at leisure on some veg. Kim's character, she's definitely the bossy one. Um, she's definitely quite full on. Um, she is a little bit like her mum, a little bit stubborn sometimes, um, but other than that, yeah. Very nice girly, really. With Tien, he's a little bit of a quiet lad. He likes to kind of chill out. She's always the one that's always there, and he's kind of, you know, a little bit behind her, you know, kind of egging her on, but she always has to do everything first. But they seem to complement each other really quite well, so it, it is really nice. Both gibbons are spectacular to watch as they move swiftly through their tree-filled enclosure, their long arms allowing them to move effortlessly from branch to branch. And sometimes they get to show off their high wire walking skills as well. As soon as they finish breakfast, they sing their own unique duet, announcing to everyone in the vicinity they're a strong united pair and this is their territory. A 
lot of the success the park has had in caring for and rearing golden-cheeked gibbons runs in tandem with the work carried out by its sister sanctuary in Vietnam, Dao Tien. Set up 10 years ago with the full support and cooperation of the Vietnamese authorities, it's a 56-hectare island in the Dong Nai province, 160 miles northeast of Ho Chi Minh City. Since it opened, the team at Dao Tien have rescued a large number of primates, including golden-cheeked gibbons, black-shanked duklangas, and pygmy loris. Unlike at Monkey World, the ultimate aim at Dao Tien is to release the primates back into the wild. Marina Kenyon runs the center in Vietnam. She's in Dorset for a flying visit to meet up with Alison and discuss the future release of eight gibbons back into the wild. I can't imagine them not having a chance to the wild. I never, ever want to see them sit in a cage forever. Any of our gibbons, I want them all to have a chance if, if we think that they're fit enough. There's some, there's some that are just are broken. The trade, the illegal trade has broken them and they're not going out and that's fine. But the ones that still are within our criteria for release candidates, they're all going to have a chance. Because when you're in the forest and you see wild gibbons and you see what a wild gibbon can do, it's amazing. And you realize actually there is no other place that a gibbon should be bar in the wild. The gibbons at Dao Tien are separated into two different areas. The phase one animals are kept in secure enclosures and include gibbons in the process of rehabilitation and those who will never be fit or well enough for release into the wild. The remainder live in semi-wild areas on the island. You rehabilitate a gibbon by giving it trees. So the eight gibbons we have at the moment have all grown up in trees. So from the moments we confiscated them, they passed health checks, we gave them some friends or a, a stepmum, and they've lived in the trees ever since. So these gibbons are just like wild gibbons. They're hitting seven and a half kilos. A gibbon in the cage will only hit seven and a half kilos if it's fat. The ones in the trees are just pure muscle. So this is probably as good as it gets as far as getting the gibbons ready for release. Over the years, Dao Tien has had great success. 65 pygmy lorises and a number of black-shanked dootlangas have been released back into the trees and forests of Vietnam. But they've had mixed results with golden-cheeked gibbons. Past releases have highlighted issues with hunting pressures, the abundance of fruiting trees in an area, and most recently, territory problems. When a wild male attacked the newly released pair. It's all led to Marina and her team stepping back and taking stock. A normal family of gibbons in the forest takes an area of around 40 hectares. But actually, to put a non-related family into forest, you need much, much more. You need potentially four to six times that space empty for that gibbon group to survive. If it's less than that, any existing gibbons, they have the territories, the empty territories next to them marked out for their offspring. That's where my son's going, that's where my daughter's going, and they will fight to the death to make, maintain that space for their own family, their own extended family. So we have to make sure that the space is way, way much bigger. Thankfully, the Vietnamese government may have come up with the solution. In the last year, they've bought 10,000 hectares of forest connected to Cat Tien National Park, which Dao Tien is part of, and made it available for future gibbon releases. And so, in the last few months, Marina and her team, along with forest rangers who protect the area, have been undertaking habitat surveys. They've checked the density of fruiting trees and looked for wild gibbons in the vicinity. At the moment, things are looking good. At this point, it's looking incredibly positive that we have, we have eight amazing gibbons and we have 10,000 hectares of forests to release them into. So, we're hoping by the end of the year, the first gibbons will be going out with their GPS collars and then the next 18 months um, to two years, we'll be tracking them. We we'll try and do them as far and apart as possible. And this is all going to be in... Alison and Marina are in constant contact, but with eight gibbons ready for release, there's a lot to sort out. Once we have the clear mapping of the space, and then we can work out... A, okay. do we have enough for everyone? Yeah, and, and you haven't surveyed this area yet. With her frequent visits to Dao Tien, Alison is well aware of the difficult task Marina is facing. 
trying to find the correct place to release them has probably become one of our most overwhelming preoccupations of trying to find good, healthy, strong, and safe forests for all of them to go back to. And, you know, with the gibbons, it's tricky. All of the gibbons that we tend to get confiscated in Vietnam and brought to Dao Tien have come through the black market trade mostly at a younger age. Many of them have sat in cages in people's homes or wherever it might be um, through their formative years and therefore don't know how to swing through the trees or perhaps even frightened of being up at height and even more detrimental to their health and long-term future in the forest is that they're interested in people and they like coming to the ground. And if you're a gibbon and you're interested in people and you like coming to the ground, you're simply gonna get caught back up in the trade by hunters easy. The gibbons also, when they pair bond, they have their territory, they sing. They sing loudly and beautifully. It's, it's you know, a beacon to any hunter who's out there that we are here. It's like a tannoy going out every morning telling any people in the area that there are now gibbons on site. So there are many, many, many different aspects of their biology, their ecology, their evolution, their social behavior that sort of set the odds against the gibbons. It's part of what drives at least me forward in wanting to come up with the right path and the right method in order to get these animals back out into the wild. It's a very exciting time for Dao Tien and everyone connected with it. If the release of the eight gibbons goes well, it could pave the way for many more of this vulnerable species to go back to where they belong. I think we are moving forward and making progress with the gibbon releases and this next year with eight ready to go out will have a significant knock-on effect for the rest of them on Marina's list who are ready to go and there's a few. It's been a long time coming and it's so good that no one's given up. Nothing, nothing in life that's wonderful can be done quickly <laughs> and given rehabilitation is absolutely one of those, it's, it's not quick, but we're just, we're just about there now, so fingers crossed. Next time on Monkey Life. A heart-stopping moment for the team when something goes wrong as Gibbon Kitty is prepared for a health check. Still really, really low. Um, we need a bit of atropine. We have a heartbeat. Yeah, but it's very slow. And flirty females try and put Capuchin Winslow off his dinner. 